How do you trade a life of stability for one of adventure and the unknown? Learn how firsthand from our featured speaker, Larry Jacobson, in this episode of Pause for Purpose. He had a childhood dream of sailing around the world. It took 33 years to realize that dream, but he and his crew circumnavigated the globe for six years and returned home with lessons learned and stories for a lifetime. We're just real thrilled that you're, first of all, that Larry's here and that all of you are here with us. And uh, we have a real California native uh, among us. Uh, Larry grew up on uh, the beaches uh, in California and was, as a kid, was sailing, swimming, scuba diving, uh, kayaking, and, and he was literally that kid behind the marina gate, staring at all that was going on in the marina and also looking at that sea beyond and saying, someday, and uh, what did it take, 33 years uh, to finally make this dream happen. But he went on, earned degrees from University of California at Irvine, also at Berkeley, and had an entrepreneurial focus as well as uh, a real adventure uh, for just being outdoors. So it catapulted him right into the logical career path would be adventure travel. And uh, he launched in the adventure travel industry where he led whitewater rafting explorations and also went to New Zealand and did the uncharted rivers of New Zealand. He stayed in tourism uh, for years and in the early 80s, uh, his career became, went to incentive travel which was a really interesting uh, profession at that time, especially when you look at what the hyper growth and the, the tremendous growth in the travel industry uh, during the, those years. And Larry, better you did that then than now. Exactly. <laughs> Given what's going on in the world. So uh, in that year, he spent 20 years and uh, first five years grounding himself in the whole field and then founded the Creative Incentive Group and partnered with the world-class incentives. And then in typical Larry style, led both of those companies to influential status in the whole incentive travel industry in, and in meeting planning, where he specialized in sales, marketing, and also in the execution of his projects. And as we understand and have read, he directed memorable events and earned a stellar reputation for orchestrating one-of-a-kind exper experiences with lots of drama. So after 20 years of doing that, he seized the opportunity to go back to that boy behind the gate and uh, decided to make that lifelong dream reality. And that's really the focus of our time today. So Larry embarked on the sale of a lifetime around the world and regardless of how many people start out that venture, very few complete it. And we're about to meet the, the fellow who did. And Vicki will be asking questions. So it'll be an informal interview style. And then feel free to ask questions. But Larry, you've got the floor and welcome. Wow. Who was, it was fantastic. Who wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> I don't really need, I don't need to say anything else. <laughs> um, that boy behind the gate. <laughs> yes. My husband is reading the book now. He's uh, I think he's in New He said he's in, I said, so where is he? He's in New Zealand. Ah. So that's where he's at. He might be a little farther. He read, read a long time last night. Um, so um, as a person who also sailed, we owned a boat, we sailed, we started with canoes and kayaks. Um, we went to sailboats. Then we decided that we would become bare boat charters. So we bare boat chartered at someone else's boat for whatever time we wanted to be gone, returned the keys and had great memories and great experience. A good kind of boat, someone else's. It is, it is. Pay the insurance and hand the keys in when you're done. So I have some questions for you and, and um, let's start with when you were a 13 year old boy behind that, those gates and seeing all those yachts, peering out at the sea. What images and ideas came to you at that time? Um, and how did those ideas continue to haunt you as the desire to complete this dream? <clears throat> Start with the hard ones, huh? <laughs> so um, I first learned to sail when I was 13 uh, in, down in Long Beach. My brother uh, found a styrofoam hole of a boat in a um in a dumpster 
and he brought it home for me to me because I was laid up because I had broken my leg, and um, so I, I took my bought a sailing rig for it and I painted the boat bright yellow and um, taught myself to sail on Alameda's Bay, and um, I sailed that boat for uh, three years, just kind of on and off and sailing it around. I mean, literally, it was like 11 feet long. It had a draft, which of a, I mean, a, a freeboard of about, the freeboard is a distance between the water and the top of the hull of the boat of about a foot and a half. I mean, it was just like a little nothing. And so that's what I learned to sail in. And the, the boy behind the gate all happened when I was 16, actually. And I um, had saved my money from working at my father's factory. And I bought a Hobie Cat, a Hobie 14. And I remember I paid $950 for it. And um, my mother took me up to um, Hermosa Beach to a place to buy it. And it was uh, Hobie Cat number 21. So if you've ever seen them sailing around, you know there's hundreds of thousands of them now. And um, I used to sail with Hobie Alter and, um, and his kid and Wayne Schaefer and all the great guys who invented those things and everything. But, um, and every day I would, uh, and when I was in school, in the afternoons I would ride my bicycle down to the marina, no helmet of course. And uh, I would take my boat out of the boat yard and I was on a trailer and I would launch it and I'd go sailing around and practice sailing and then I'd come back. And then afterwards I was, I got this feeling, it was like, I love this, I had found my passion. And I was thinking, well, but what, there's gotta be something more. And then I'd be riding around on my bike around the marinas and looking at all the big boats, like 40 feet, 45 feet, 50 feet. And I would park and I would go to push the gates and they were always locked to the marina. So literally I would stand there and I would just stare at them. And what I think went through my mind was why not me? Why can't I have one of these boats? Why can't I be the one behind the wheel? And um, I just, I loved sailing. Um, well, then one day I sailed that Hobie Cat 14 from Long Beach to Catalina Island, um, which is a crazy thing to do. Uh, it's 26 miles across open ocean. It can be a very rough channel. And um, I remember calling my mother from Catalina and I was like, hello, mom. Um, I'm in Catalina. And that would normally trigger to any normal parent, you know, who would just go, are you nuts? You know, and um, she just said, oh, that's nice, dear. Does that mean you won't be home for dinner? And, <laughs> you know, so it's like, no, I won't. I'll sail home tomorrow. But that was when I decided that, uh, that I had made it to Catalina. I thought, why can't I just keep going? And that was when I came back, I announced to my mother and everybody else that I was going to sail around the world. And that was when I was 16. So and I left when I was 46, so 30 years. And um, keeping that passion alive was, I, looking back on it now, it seems amazing to be able to have kept a passion alive for 30 years to want to, to, to do something. But it was so strong. And I had just, I had decided that was what I was going to do. And, you know, my parents were, I was lucky. I had great parents who taught me that when you decide to do something, then you can do it. Um, I remember about halfway through the trip when we were in Singapore and uh, it was incredibly hot and miserable and things were broken on the boat and things kept continually breaking. And, um, you know, Corky knows what I'm talking about. And, uh, I called my mother and I said, well, I'm thinking about ending a trip here and selling the boat here in Singapore. And she goes, and my mother who didn't want me to go in the first place. And she was really scared that I was going to go. Uh, and she was afraid when I left and everything. But when I called her from Singapore and said, I was going to end the trip. She goes, Oh no, you don't. She goes, you started it and you're going to finish it. And I'll bake you cookies when you get home. So <laughs> anyway, I just. So you are um, you now you you're the head of a company, your company. Um, you're um, doing very well, and you purchased this wonderful sailboat, and you now start planning for your journey, this trip around the world. 
how did you start that plan? How, how did you map your, what is my husband called, float plan? How did you plan that? Yeah, um, well, I, uh, we sold our company and then I actually had to stay on for three years. So during that three years um, is the time when I was, you know, uh, my partner Bob and I had decided that we, I was going to, we were going to basically retire or you know, end the company. We did not have enough money to do that. We thought that we might have enough money. And I kind of was teased into thinking that I had enough money, but I didn't. Um, but anyway, uh, for those three years, that's like all I talked about, all I thought about. And when the payments for having sold the company started to come in during the last year of those three, that's when I was able to get the boat. And um, I bought the boat eight months before I left. So it was all planned that I was leaving, but I didn't even have the boat. So um, when, it, when, it, when I was shopping for the boat, I was looking all over the place, all over the world. And I found the, bro the boat that I wanted um, this 50 foot Stevens in Fort Lauderdale. And so my broker said, you couldn't have found a boat in California. And said, nope. It's the one that's in Fort Lauderdale. So we trucked it from Fort Lauderdale to here to San Francisco. And um, it arrived with needing a lot of work. And I spent the next eight months with a bunch of friends who came down to help me work on the boat. And, uh, you know, I provide the beer, come on down. Painting is fun. <laughs> and um, so I don't know that it was, I think the hardest part certainly was leaving, was leaving everything. I mean, the planning ahead, all, all I had planned was that we would sail south to Mexico and then we would cross the Pacific from Mexico, which is the standard route that you basically take. So, so you had to plan also weather to yeah. plan to understand the changing weather patterns you were gonna be running into that certainly affected timing, certainly affected a lot of things. How did you incorporate the weather idea? In yeah, the, weather's, the weather is really important. Um, and so like, we left it here in De December, um, right in between storms that were rack, packed up all the way to Hawaii. But there was a two day window that we were able to sneak out. We sailed south. And um, in December, certainly it's a terrible time to be sailing off the coast of California. But once we got to San Diego, then it was, it, we knew it was gonna ease up. So when we got to Puerto Vallarta, we hung out there and did repairs and practice and, and kind of got to know the boat more. Uh, for a couple of months and we left in uh, we left April 1st to cross the Pacific and that's the standard time and what you're looking what you're incorporating is hurricane season or in the southern hemisphere they call it cyclone season so you don't want to be anywhere near a hurricane or a cyclone and uh, the idea is when you sail across the Pacific into the islands like um, French Polynesia and Tonga uh, and, and all those islands, Fiji and all that, you're out of the hurricane season and you have to, and then for six months, and then hurricane season comes back and you have to leave. You have, you have to either go north or south. So you're, you're forced to leave hurricane season um, unless you're crazy. <laughs> and um, so we sailed then south to New Zealand. So you stay in New Zealand while you're waiting out the hurricane season up in the Pacific. When that was over, then we sailed back into the Pacific, spent six more months, hurricane season came back, we sailed south to Australia. So you're always running away from hurricane season, essentially. And you're doing that all the way around the world, and you're following the trade winds, which have certain times of year that are going your direction. So when you left San Francisco Bay Harbor, what were you feeling as you knew you were going to sail around the world and it took you six years. Did you really think it would take you six years? Well, I didn't know I was going around the world. Oh, okay. I mean, I, 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 it's an interesting question because some people say, yeah, you always said you were going around the world. And I know I had announced that when I was 16, 
But then when we left, I thought, well, I'm just going for a couple of years because that's really all the money I had was for a couple of years. And um, uh, so I didn't really know how far we were going to get. And uh, Ken and I didn't make the decision to sail, to continue on around the world until New Zealand, until we had gotten, until we were in New Zealand. Um, that's where most people sell their boats and, or turn around or ship their boat back or whatever. And that's when we decided to go on. But the, back to, to your original question, which was, what did I feel when we sailed out the gate? Um, I was, it was the scariest day of my life, I'll tell you that no matter what ever happened to me uh, in the rest of, uh, on the rest of the trip, that day was the scariest day of my life. Um, I remember thinking that, well, if I'm gonna be captain, I better start acting like one. And cause I was just, I was afraid, I was timid. I didn't really, I didn't have the experience to be doing this. Um, and I remember I had to pee. <laughs> Those were the thoughts that went through my head when I sailed out the gate. And, um, uh, you know, I had, a, a, at that time, just going out the gate and south to Santa Barbara, there were, there was myself and four other people on board, because some people wanted to get a little, you know, be there for the, you know, for the big send off. And then in Santa Barbara, two of those people left. In San Diego, another one left. And so it was left with three of us. And that was how we crossed, um, that's how we did much of the sale, but most of the sale around the world was just two of us, myself and my then partner, Ken. So um, when you, I just have to know this, you're in Mexico, how long does it take you? I mean, Wild Pacific's a big place. How long were you at sail? So from Puerto Vallarta to the Marquesas Islands is 2,750 miles. Oh my God. And that was, it took us 21 days. Oh my word, just yeah. water, you saw no land, just water. There's no land out there. I'm looking at a map right here, there's <laughs> yeah. no land I see. And, and to, answer the, to answer the question of one of my mother's friends, um, what did you do at night? You, you, you know, where did you stop? You don't. The boat runs 24 uh, seven and it doesn't matter if it's daytime, nighttime, good weather, bad weather, the boat, you can't, you don't stop anything. So you get on a regular watch system. I had two other crew crossing the Pacific with us, two friends who were down in Mexico. And so there ended up being five of us on board for that 2,750 miles. And that was interesting because it was, not only was, was I captain and, and, and sailing, but I also felt more like I was back in business managing a team of people because there were five of us and uh, it, yes, you know, it was a decent sized boat, it was 50 feet, but five people for 21 days is a very close quarters. And you have to make sure that everybody has something to do and that everybody likes the schedule and that uh, everybody gets along. You know, I remember, uh, I remember throwing two crew members, Ken and Patrick into my cabin and slamming the door and saying, and don't come out and tell your friends. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it can, because it can be a very small space. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> share the story behind Julia at sea. Can you, what do you mean? Um, your, your boat was named Julia, right? Yes. And you're, you're this, you're now captain. You're taking command and you're very dependent on your instruments, your headings, that if you're out there for 21 days, how confident were you in your equipment and your boat and your headings and the information and data you were receiving that you're going to head up where you want to be in 21 days seeing nothing? Yeah, uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. Um, well, how confident was I? You don't have any choice. You, you're just 100% confident. Because, and, and you have to watch that on a regular basis. Over 2,750 miles, if you're one degree off course, you will miss your destination by 48 miles. If you are two degrees off course, you'll miss the entire island by 100 miles. 
So you completely would miss your destination uh, totally. Um, I remember one time uh, I was down below and I noticed that the boat was, you know, I had taken a nap and I woke up and I was noticed the boat was sailing really nice, really smooth, really calm. I don't know, we were, had gone maybe a thousand miles or something. And I came up on deck and I saw Patrick behind the wheel. And I said, hey, we're doing, looking really good. It's uh, really comfortable. The weather's really cooperating. And then I looked at the compass and I realized that we were 15 degrees off course, which is why we were so comfortable. And I said to Patrick, what? we're 15 degrees off course. What are you doing? And he says, well, it's more comfortable this way, isn't it? And I said, yeah, but the next stop is Japan. <laughs> so um, I did have to watch it on a regular basis and you're constantly correcting your course. So, you know, as, as the currents throw you off course or the wind throws you off course, you're constantly correcting. We had the latest um, GPS and autopilot systems. And so uh, with redundant systems as backups, um, and celestial navigation if for backup to that if we needed it. Um, but I wasn't all that good at celestial navigation. So we pretty much relied on the GPS uh, system and the autopilot. And it's so accurate and it's so perfect. Uh, we were just, we were amazed. What is not accurate necessarily though, are the charts. So the GPS system is never wrong. It always tells you exactly where you are down to like a yard. But the chart that you're plotting your GPS position onto, if the chart is off by a mile, then you're off by a mile. <coughs> so we noticed that the accidents that had happened uh, on boats that had been run into islands or run into reefs and things, it was because their chart was wrong, which we all had the same charts. And so you also had to be very visually aware um, when you're coming, there were you know, stories of people coming into marinas or, and into anchorages just relying just on the chart and the GPS system. The GPS would have been right, but if the chart was wrong they, and they had, had hit the rocks. Um, and so you have to be very vigilant uh, visually as well. And if it's night, then you have to use radar, not the chart, because the radar never lies either. So we had, good, we had good equipment. I mean, the autopilot failed us miserably because it was not strong enough to handle our weight of our boat, but we eventually replaced it and everything was all right. So you got to your first destination. How long did you stay? Oh, we were in, uh, well, we went to the Marquesas Islands. We stayed there, I think a few weeks. And the Marquesas is part of French Polynesia. So it goes to the Marquesas Islands, then the Tuamoto Atolls, which are just like coral atolls and you, with one entrance in, into it. And you go into this entrance and then you're in this huge lagoon of protected waters. And uh, we were there for a couple of weeks and then on to Tahiti and Morea and Bora Bora and all the beautiful classic islands that, you know. Uh, so I would think we were in, uh, French Polynesia for a couple of months. Um, and it's still probably the most beautiful of all the scenery. The French got all the pretty stuff. <laughs> they, they, they really did. I mean, they, uh, uh, as you go around the world, most of the most beautiful locations in the tropics are French, French owned or directed. Um, so as you talked about some of your uh, experiences, your fears. Um, you ran into these wild, strange animals on a beach that chased you off the beach. What were they and where were you? So we were in the island, we were in Indonesia, um, and there's two islands. Um, there's an island called Komodo, and there's another one called Rincha. And these are the islands where the only place in the world where Komodo dragons live. Mm. And Komodo dragons are basically giant lizards. Um, they're about uh, three or four feet around and they're 12 to 14 feet long, and they run up to 15 miles an hour. And they eat meat, <laughs> including humans, and they are poisonous, which a lot of people don't know. They, uh, if all if they have to do is scratch you, and the poison goes into your system, and then after two or three days, it affects your nervous system, and you collapse. And what they do is they, they scratch their, their prey, 
and then they just follow it around for a couple of days until it collapses. When we were there, we saw four Komodo dragons sitting around eating a water buffalo they had taken down. So you can imagine how big a water buffalo is. Um, anyway, we were in Rincha at the National Park. We had just had a tour with a guide who was showing us all about the dragons and everything. And then we were going back, headed back to the boat. And to get back to the boat, we had to walk along this trail, which was, if you could just imagine, a narrow trail about three feet wide. And then on one side is a steep cliff, about 80 degree angle. And the other side is a steep cliff that drops 100 feet down into a ravine. So we're on exactly that portion of the trail and coming uh, behind us, uh, we saw, I mean, coming towards us, we see two Komodo dragons. There's not room for both on the trail. And they didn't stop. They weren't hesitating. And we kind of stopped. They kept coming. One of them had like half of a chicken hanging out of its mouth. And when they walk, they walk with like, like this and their claws grip and their yellow forked tongue comes out. And it's just, they're so creepy. I mean, they're just like the creepiest, <laughs> scariest animal you ever can imagine. And they're enormous. And you know that if they scratch you, you're going to die. And um, so we turned around and started walking the other way. And then we looked back and realized that they were starting to run. They were chasing us. And we just took off running. And we were in flip-flops. And <laughs> we had been at sea for weeks. And we couldn't run, you know, maybe very fast at all we had two choices up this cliff or down the ravine and the only answer was up and we we're just like go 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 and we grabbed onto rocks and and grass that was sticking out of the cliff and a tree branch and we finally climbed up this cliff about 20 feet and we were ken and i were both just hanging there on this cliff and the dragon stopped right below us and they just stopped and they're just looking up at us as if to say and stay off of our trail you know, and, and then they walked on. And as soon as they walked on, we scrambled back down, you know, bleeding from the cliff and everything and just took off and ran towards the dinghy and got into our little dinghy and then back to Julia. And we realized how, at that point, how Julia had become our, our safe haven, our home. <laughs> um, and we had a new appreciation for, you know, for her. And uh, it was my fault. I mean, I was the one who always was fascinated with by Komodo dragons, and I had always wanted to go there to this place. And you can only get there by boat. And, um, you know, so we get back to the boat, and Ken looks at me, and he says, have we seen enough dragons for now? <laughs> <laughs> so your next encounter, you didn't, but some boats that were traveling with you experienced the pirates. And I don't know if anybody <laughs> saw the um, uh, Tom Hanks movie. Um, which I Captain don't Phillips. Yes, and the uh, the pirates, and so you, your some of your your sailing mates experienced the pirates. Explain yeah. That. Well, we experienced pirates two times. Um, one was in the Malacca Straits, which is down in Southeast Asia near Singapore, and uh, that was it was an incident that I briefly touched on in the book, but um, I didn't make a big thing of it. I was on deck, Ken was asleep, and this we saw this boat coming towards us. I mean, I saw this boat coming towards us, and uh, I could just tell that they were up to no good. You can just tell, it's like, why aren't they fishing? What are they doing? Where are they going? The position that we were in was in a place that there was no fishing going on. And anyway, at that time we had, it was, the wind was in our favor. We had full sail. We, I turned the engine on and, we actually outran this boat. Um, we were doing about 10 to 12 knots, which is really fast for a sailboat like ours. Anyway, um, but that was the one in Malacca Straits. But then we went through um, Pirate Alley. And Pirate Alley is in the Gulf of Aden, right uh, below Oman and Yemen. And that is um, exactly what you're talking about. We, the, when we, you, you go from Oman to Aden, Yemen, it's a 300 mile stretch. And that's Pirate Alley. When they call, talk about Pirate Alley, because that's where the pirates, basically any boat that gets squeezed into this narrow point, they're susceptible. Today, there's military highways. They're called military cor corridors. 
And it's basically a highway that gives you the latitude and longitude of this highway. And if you stay within that area, pretty much there's going to be a ship coming by, a military ship, often enough that it prevents a lot of the piracy. Um, but it was pretty much the exact place where the uh, Captain Phillips, where that boat was um, was hijacked. And um, there were fr when we were on our, our trip from Oman to Yemen, we had missed the convoy because boats all traveled in convoy for safety. But we left Thailand too uh, late, and we had gotten to Oman late, and the convoy had already left. And so we were behind and there were only three boats, us and two other boat friends on, uh, uh, on two other boats. And uh, they decided that they were gonna stay close to shore. And they were about 25 miles offshore when they were attacked. And we had decided that we were going to be way offshore because Julia was very worth, seaworthy. And so we were, you, you basically go in between the two spits of pieces of land but you want to be as away, a far away from each piece of land as possible. So we were about 80 miles offshore and we were running with no lights and in radio silence because lights and radios can pinpoint your position and the pirates know how to do that. Um, and we were, but we were listening on the radio on a single sideband radio and we heard this all happen live. So our friends were on a, uh, to the two different boats, they were 25 miles offshore, and they saw these two pirate boats coming towards them. And the boats came closer and closer and closer. And then uh, these people stood up with machine guns and started shooting, literally <laughs> shooting at these at our friends. There's what we saw them afterwards. There are bullet holes all over the all over the boat and all over the mast, and just uh, it was amazing. Well, when they got close. Um, our friend Rod uh, was an ex-Navy guy, and he was armed heavily. And um, he stood up when they got really close, and he shot a shotgun at them, uh, which is r a really good defensive weapon. And um, he killed two of the hostages, I mean, two of the pirates. Then the other boat, uh, the other sailboat, turned and, and rammed one of the pirate boats and cut that pirate boat in half. They're about 25 foot open motor boats. And so between the two of them, they, they took care of the pirates, but then they kind of limped their way back, you know, into Aden and then word got around and um, the Yemen Coast Guard made sure that every single foreign yacht that came in to that uh, harbor had to be anchored in a certain area because they were afraid of retribution from the pirates' families. So, so when we got in there, um, and, and, and all of a sudden, it was like all the chatter on the radio that was going on about this. When we approached Yemen, uh, at the harbor at Aden, uh, we were told to stop, and it was a French warship that was calling us, saying, you have to identify yourselves or, or, you know, or, or you're not going anywhere. So we identified ourselves and they go, okay, you're, you're free to proceed. And we go into Aden Harbor and it was just like our nerves. We had been, you know, for two and a half days, just like, you know, what are we going to do? What's our plan if, if we do get attacked? What if, what if they start shooting? Do we stop and let them aboard? Do we, uh, you know, hit them with our purse? Do we, you know, what, I mean, what, what is it that we're going to do? And we didn't have weapons aboard. We had, um, our weapons were fire extinguishers, a chemical fire extinguisher that you would shoot in someone's face. Um, we had bear spray, mace, um, and um, well, Good. And, a spear, and a spear gun, <laughs> which doesn't so, work unless it's underwater. <laughs> so you're now at sea a long time. You're starting to become comfortable with the boat and, and with yourself and your leadership. What are your, in, are, we're all about purpose. I mean, our, 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 my future purpose is about purpose. So were you reevaluate as you're doing this and as you're stopping at these different courts and having these different experiences, where are you in terms of thinking of your own purpose at this time? That's a good, that's a really good question. And I would have to say the answer is rather selfish. Um, 
the answer was my purpose was to get my boat around the world. <laughs> that was it. Safely. And that, that, that's the honest answer. And if I didn't have that purpose, I never would have made it. And that's, I think, why most people don't make it around the world is they're not uh, solely fixed on, on that as their purpose. Because everything has to feed into it. Everything has to feed into that one priority of getting the boat around the world. Everything that you do, everything that you, that you think, every expense, everything has to be towards that. Um, that changed when I got home, my purpose changed. So, but I bet you have that in another question probably. Yes, I do, I do. <laughs> um, so you also traversed the Red Sea. Yeah. And had experienced terrible weather, 30 foot waves. Yeah. And, your, oh, wow. your, and your destination was where, and you were at that 23 hours of 30 foot waves? So there was, um, the, yeah, it was, the, we're going up the Red Sea, which is 1,200 miles, and the wind blows from the north, and we're, and we're headed north. So you're r going right against the wind, and the Red Sea is narrow, and it's also relatively shallow compared to other, uh, other seas. And we uh, had been scuba diving at this reef that you can only get to by your own boat, which is an amazing scuba dive. And um, we had decided that we were going to do one more dive. And so we did this one more dive that took, you know, several hours to, to complete. And we knew the storm was coming, that the high winds were coming, but they came 24 hours early because this, the forecasting in the Red Sea is really difficult and incredibly inaccurate. I mean, I love the Egyptians, but they know nothing about, about <laughs> forecasting weather. And uh, so you, you have to do it yourself. And so the chatter on the radio is all about what's the barometric pressure in Cairo? What's the barometric pressure in Djibouti? Now let's subtract the two. How long did it take for, the, for it to change from this to this? And it's, it's a bit complicated. And so we had miscalculated. And we ended up, the, the, the wind kept, there were uh, myself, Ken, and another crew was on for about 10 days named CJ. And um, when we were, we were motoring north against this wind and it comes up to like 10 knots, 15 knots, 20 knots, 25 knots, Ken turns to me and he says, it's here, isn't it? And I said, yeah, it's coming early. And then it gets to 30 knots, 35 knots. And that's when CJ says, oh boy, I always wanted to be out in a big storm, right? And at the same time, Ken and I turn him and just go, shut up. No, 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 the wind gods will hear you. Don't say that. It was too late. So it, the winds piped up to 55 to 60 knots, which is a full gale. And they stayed that way for 24 hours. And the seas, because of where we were, which was the most shallow point of the Red Sea, which I know now after having looked back, um, it, we had the seas were 30 feet, literally 30 feet. And I know that because we were, when we would be down in the trough in between waves, I would look up and see where they were on the mast wow. and our mast was 70 feet tall. So, um, I could easily tell that they were easily 30 feet, if not more. And, uh, they were, the other thing is they weren't just big seas. They were steep. I mean, they were the, probably steeper seas I've ever seen. And they were coming really fast. So a typical seas will come, the, the interval between them might be in a bad storm, six, eight seconds, a regular basis, 10 to 15 seconds. If you can look out, you know, go off the coast there where you are, you know, just in a regular day, there'll probably be 15 seconds in between swells, something like that. These were coming every three seconds. And it was just, it, I mean, the boat would fly up off the top of the wave and then we would slam down into the trough and the boat would shake and everything. And Ken would say, I think we broke something, you know, and it was just, anyway, the autopilot could handle it. Um, but uh, I was better at it. Than, I mean, the autopilot was good, but you never left the wheel. I mean, even with the autopilot running, you just didn't leave the wheel because you, in case of uh, something went, it would let go or something. And it was, um, it was incredibly scary. It was, uh, I mean, I remember looking over at Ken and CJ and just seeing their eyes were just like wide as saucers. I mean, it was, 
uh, you know, and they were just shaking it in their boots. And at that point, and I was scared too. I mean, I wasn't scared. I was terrified, you know, and it, it, I was scared, you know, for myself, am I going to die? I mean, there's, you know, good chance of it. Are we going to, uh, is the boat going to fall apart? Um, but I was concerned for, for my crew. So, um, I mean, the only way out of it, were, there are two ways out of it. One would be to turn around and to run with the wind and with the storm. But we had worked so hard to gain the miles that we did in the Red Sea that the thought of giving those back up and, and having to do this again uh, was, you know, we didn't like that idea. And also the Red Sea is very narrow. If you turn around and run with uh, 50 knot winds, before you know it, you're going to be on at the shore on the other side. So we motor sailed into it at about two and a half knots and uh, finally found our way to a Marsa. And, and a Marsa in the Red Sea is a, a small inlet um, that serves as an anchorage. And it's not like an island, it's actually a cut out, a natural, uh, kind of a natural bay. And then there's like a, a bar entrance, like it's a river. And so we, I, I found this place in the guidebook when I was down, down below looking for a, where we could go anchor and um, the, looked at it. And the entrance to this Marsa was about 100 feet wide. And well, we were 50 feet long. And then the depth that it showed, I, th I can't remember, but basically what we did is you have to do the math. So you look at the shallowest piece of land in, at the bar. It was something like, eight feet. Well, we were six and a half feet deep. Well, now what's the tide? Um, and so is the tide up or down? So you're doing the math. And I kind of felt like the guy on uh, in the movie Apollo 13, where, you know, I was doing my the math and the numbers and doing, okay, plus the tide of three feet minus this. And then I would, I was so tired and I was, you know, just, I would go, Ken, check my math. I, I don't know if I added right. You know, and um, anyway, we, we figured it out that we think we're going to have a foot under the keel, a foot of clear water. Wow. And so when we came into it, we came in at about eight knots, which is really fast for our boat. And uh, you're looking to hit this narrow channel. And we we're just flying into it at, from big seas and point up a little bit because you're knowing the wind's going to push you down a little bit. And just like that, and boom, right into flat water. And I thought we had hit ground because it was so flat and calm. And it wasn't. We were in the Marsha, just like that. And the wind <laughs> stayed blowing for three days while we sat there in that anchorage. Yeah. Yeah, so, anchorage. Sorry, no, you're coming story. home. Huh? You're coming home. You let everyone know that you're on your way. You're, you made it. You've been gone six years. Yeah. And a lot has happened. Yeah. Um home and you pull into you see San Francisco your, your hope when you left San Francisco Bay was that you would be able to see it upon your return how did you feel when you saw that and what were your what were your feelings then to be home and how did your how did your friends and family um, celebrate with you upon that return <clears throat> well um uh that's a hard one to say without tearing up, <laughs> but the, the whole thing happened exactly how I had pictured it. Um, years before, I mean, even before we left, I had, I had had this visions of, of how the return would be. And then I could, and I could see myself sailing back under the bridge. And I actually, before we left, I could see this vision of people, of friends and family standing on the Golden Gate Bridge, shouting and with signs welcoming us. And sure enough, they were there. And, <laughs> and before we left, I could see boats coming out to greet us from other friends. And sure enough, they were there. And I could see fire boats shooting the sprays of water and everything, welcoming us home. And they didn't show up. But uh, <laughs> I didn't know anybody in the fire department. I didn't know who to call, you know. <laughs> but um, it, no, it was, it, we, we, I had told everybody when exactly when we were going to sail underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. 
And because uh, we had anchored in uh, Half Moon Bay, which is just a day sail away from down the coast here. And so I knew we could make that by a certain time. I believe it was 12 noon that I told everybody. So we were early, we got, we were up early and we, we, we arrived at the outer marker, which is two miles offshore uh, of San Francisco. And we had, we waited there and circled around and drank champagne while we were waiting for the right time to sail under, to sail under the gate. So by the time we got under the gate, we were all drunk. I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, it was like, uh, and so we got under the gate and I just started bawling. I was just, I, I was just crying. I mean, I just, and I even looked over at Ken and Ken's kind of a tough guy and tries not to show his emotions and everything. And he was crying and I thought, oh, wow, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, that's something. I've never seen Ken cry. Um, and it was, uh, it was an emotional overload. I mean, it was, it was, I can't believe that I, that we achieved this because so few people do. And I'm happy that we did because I had always wanted to do this. This was my lifelong dream. And I, and, and, um, so we then, we came into the gate, we sailed around San Francisco Bay for a little bit. Other boats were following us and, we had all of our flags flying, our international flags um, from where we had been and we had dressed Julia up, you know, and, and everything. Um, and then we came into Emeryville Marina, which is where we had left from. And there were about a hundred people on the dock waiting for us with cases of champagne. And I swear, I'm not, I'm not kidding, but I almost hit the dock. Oh, I, I forgot to turn the wheel hard enough over and Ken's like, turn, turn, turn. <laughs> we didn't hit, we did not hit the dock. And then we got to the dock and we tied up and I stepped off onto the dock and I kneeled down and I kissed the dock, which is a tradition. That's what you're supposed to do. And then I stood up and I said, um, uh, oh, I said two things. I said, uh, I want to make an announcement. Number one, the world is round. Right, I had just proved that, and secondly, everything is for sale. And that was, <laughs> it. That was all I could muster. And then it was just hugs and and everything. And I didn't, um, I I really didn't have. I, I'm I'm pretty sure I know where your next question is going to go because the next question has got to be, well, then what? And I didn't have a plan. I did not have a plan for what was going to happen next. And, and that's unlike me, but it was, I was so focused on getting this and achieving this and making this happen that I, I, I just didn't know, I had never even thought about it. Um, Ken was very aware of, you know, thinking what he's going to do. And he actually landed a job. Uh, he was a high, he's a computer network engineer. So he was in demand and he uh, landed a job within, I think, three days. There was an article in Latitude 38 magazine about us, um, you know, and, and uh, some guy came over who was a sailor who was the VP of uh, IT over at some company in Emeryville, and he wanted to see our boat, and he wanted to meet Ken, and he offered him a job. So that was great. <laughs> Me, I had no idea what I was going to do um, other than start to sit down to write, but I had never written a book before, and so I didn't really know what that involved. I had decided to write the book after when we when we decided we were going to sail around the world which was in New Zealand that's when I decided to to write the book and I had 2,000 pages of emails to friends and family um, uh, no, uh, my own personal journal and uh, ships logs radio logs videos to transcribe but about 2,000 pages of, of it and I just I said well I guess this is where I start and I remember after um, writing what I thought was my book and uh, I had hired an editor, uh, someone I didn't really know, but I had I'd given him the first draft and it was 750 pages. And he goes, no, 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 no. He says, you have to cut, edit, 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 cut, cut, cut. And I said, yeah, but the world's round. How do you, how do you, which part do I cut? <laughs> so anyway. So did you come back changed? Did the sea change you? Completely. How? Um, for the better, I think. Anyway, my friends think so. Uh, I, well, 
couple of things. One is that I realized uh, there were several things I realized. I, I think that the people I, I learned that the people who the people in the world who had the least were the happiest, which was an, a, a, quite a stark stark revelation for me. Because um, before leaving, I had been focused on making money because I wanted, I knew I was going to need money to do this. Um, now it was like, that was completely gone out of my head and I had spent all my money and I did, I, you know, I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, but I know that I, I, my values had changed completely and the things that people were wound up and worried about here, I just were not, it didn't even come across my mind. I mean, it was just, um, and the, the values on, on, on possessions and, you know, material possessions, you know, I used to drive an Audi and fly first class. And, you know, that when I got home, I didn't have a car and my mom ended up giving me her old beat up Honda. And I drove that for years and I was quite happy <laughs> with it, <laughs> you know? So, um, when, when, when the, my PR company asked me, um, what my goals were, I said, I want my Audi back. <laughs> <laughs> but not really. I didn't. Um, so now yeah, your it, purpose, what did, how did you reinvent yourself now? Now so, your purpose is what? Yeah. Well, I realized that, that I was searching for something for the next thing. I mean, I did realize that, that I was searching for the next thing. I knew I wanted to be a speaker and I knew I wanted to write. Um, and I, but I'd never written a book. I had done plenty of presentations and speaking, but, um, uh, so I had to learn to write and I had to, um, uh, kind of, you know, you have to kind of, uh, uh, suck up your ego because your editor is going to be brutal with you. And now I'm an editor and I'm brutal with my clients and I tell them, please don't hate me. You know, don't throw the editor away. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, and so I, um, uh, wrote the book. Um, and then I started, uh, kind of going on the free speaking circuit, you know, rotary clubs, lion clubs and lions club and things like that. And then I started getting some, uh, paid gigs and I was doing fairly well in the speaking uh, circuit, speaking about passion and following your passion and making ideas happen. And, um, uh, then, and I liked that. And I realized though, that it was still, it was okay, but it was kind of all about me. And I, something that had shifted in me and it was no longer about me. And I realized that what really drove me at that time and still now is not having completed my own achievement that I've done, but now I want to help other people do that same thing. It doesn't mean go sailing. It just means to help other people achieve their dreams, whatever they are. It could just be that you want to, you know, carve out time to, 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 to paint or to spend time with your family or to open a coffee shop or, or whatever it is. I know the process now of helping people to do that. Because what, what I did is I reverse, I took a year after I wrote my book, um, I took a year and I reverse engineered all the process I went through to leave my career and to go sailing. All the thoughts and the actions and the, the um, impulses that I had when I was going through that process. And then that's how I came up with that course, Sail Into Retirement, because I, I turned it all into a course. Like this is how you can go to the next thing in your life. And these are the steps that you take to get there. And then it was interesting, I had a friend who called me, he was a CEO, and he wanted some advice. So I went over to his office and I said, okay, well, what do you need help with uh, in the business? And he said, I don't need help in the business. I'm the CEO, I know what I'm doing. And just like most CEOs, they, when they want coaching, they don't want coaching about the business. He wanted to know how I let go of my identity and how I was able to go from CEO to sailor, just like that. And what was he gonna do when he, when it was his turn to retire. And then I got a call from another one. I think he told somebody. Anyway, before I knew it, it was like two or three CEOs who were all asking me the same questions. 
how do you do it? How do you retire? What do you, what do you do? So that's what I, so that's when I started getting, uh, publishing the course. And uh, that's when I met Joyce and the rest is history. That's great. So we usually, we, we let people ask questions. Uh, yeah. And we're a little beyond, it's five o'clock, but I'm gonna turn it open to anyone who might have a question or a series of questions for Larry. Corky. Corky. Yes, I do. Uh, Larry, uh, I'm sure there must have been some medical uh, challenges uh, over a six year period of time in the various locations. Uh, what were some of those and how were those handled or resolved? Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. Um, well, we had pretty much our own pharmacy on board. Um, a friend of mine was an anesthesiologist and he gave us pretty much, uh, you know, all the pills and that we think that we would have needed. We had, uh, but one of the things is that we were um, very safety oriented. I mean, it was my number one concern was safety on board. And everything we did was, uh, I mean, we tried anyway to, to, to be safe. We did get, um, in the Pacific, we got infections from coral cuts. Uh, you know, in the warm water, uh, you get infected. Uh, we would go to the local clinic, like in Fiji, I remember going into a clinic and then giving us powdered penicillin that you put on it, um, on the infection and that healed us. Um, in New Zealand, I remember we went to a couple of doctors. In Australia, Ken had to go to a doctor. By the way, social medicine, socialized medicine, where we experienced it and used it, which was in New Zealand, Australia, Mexico, Turkey, Israel, um, Spain, Switzerland, uh, Panama, Costa Rica, is fabulous. I mean, we uh, the most, I think, well, a couple of major things happened is I have high blood pressure, and I had high blood pressure all the time of the trip. I didn't know it. I discovered it in, in, um, in Turkey, actually. We were, at a, a, we were on board a friend's boat racing, and I was cranking the winch, and uh, my friend said, Larry, you're turning blue. And they thought I was having a heart attack. So we returned to the dock and went to the hospital, and um, it turns out that I wasn't having a heart attack. I had high blood pressure and it was dangerously high. So they put me on blood pressure pills. But that whole experience at the Turkey hospital, which was going into the blood, the heart unit and having every test you can imagine by the most modern equipment, by a, a, a cardiologist that was brilliant. Um, I think the whole overnight stay, including Ken being there with me and everything was $250. Uh, <laughs> in Mexico, we had a similar experience, same thing as I was, uh, my blood pressure was causing problems. And I went in to see the doctor and um, he says, uh, do you drink? And I said, yeah, of course. <laughs> and uh, he said, you drink too much. And, uh, I, and my blood pressure evidently was high enough that he says, I want you to go to the hospital. And uh, I said, okay, well, we'll go like the next couple of days. And he goes, oh no, and he stood up and he was packing his things into his briefcase. He says, we're going to the hospital now. And um, so we drove in his car. He takes me to the, to the hospital. This was in um, uh, uh, Mazatlan, I believe. Mazatlan, yeah, Mazatlan. And I remember them, we arriving at the hospital and them coming out with the gurney and putting me on it. And I was looking up and I saw the hospital name and emergency and I thought, holy shit, I'm the emergency, you know, and it, you realize, <laughs> and, and the doctor said, you know, he, he said, look, you drink too much, you're too fat, and you're half a century old. What do you expect? <laughs> so anyway, um, we, we were able to get to hospitals and doctors everywhere. And at sea, we were just super careful. And we were also probably really lucky because um, part of the reason that I didn't have a plan I think for my return is that honestly, and I don't say this lightly, but, and, or to everybody, but I didn't think I was going to make it back. Mm -hmm. And there are, a th it's because there's a thousand ways to die at sea. I mean, just and the boom could hit you in the head and knock you overboard. If you go overboard, you're dead. 
you, there's not even sense in turning the boat around. I mean, there's just, there's so, there's from sharks and I mean, there's so many ways to die. I thought, well, surely this will be it. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll some way, I don't know how it's going to be, but anyway, um, but we did make it and nobody really got seriously injured. Nobody lost a limb. So Great. next question. Anyone else have a question? Oh, oh, I do. Okay, go ahead, Barbara. So first of all, I read the book. I needed, um, I needed to travel and I couldn't because of COVID and I, I it was fantastic. And yeah. I wanted more. I actually said, I wanted to hear about your land adventures because I know that you spent a number of um, months, maybe even six months in some different places. So I wanted to know, it. was there any point where you had to work? Did you actually, did you need to work to kind of fill the money coffers? Um, we would have liked to, um, but uh, one, we didn't really have to, um, which is, you know, was saying a, a lot about my 20 years of work uh, in the corporate world. Um, but we did leave here uh, with Ken on board who is a network engineer and every boat out there has computers and software problems. And we actually created a banner that we were going to fly off the shrouds that said, um, computer help, call us on channel 68, you know, on the radio. So we had that all ready to go. So the idea would be that we would get into an anchorage and we would hoist that up and then people would call us and then they would pay us for Ken's services. And I would be his pimp and he would be the, the guy, right? And what happened was people still learned that Ken was a network engineer and he was brilliant at it. I mean, he uh, it was amazing and he could fix anybody's software and anybody's computer and he fixed and people would call him, but we couldn't charge. We just, we just couldn't do it. It just, it was just didn't feel right. And because these are your fellow sailors who are in need. And they helped and, you out. And, and people helped us so yeah. much. People came on board our boat. An engineer came on board and helped us rebuild our autopilot. I mean, just the things that people did for each other out there in this community were so wonderful that the thought of, of charging someone money uh, just didn't, we couldn't do it. Now, if someone called, and we would get radio calls in anchorages um, saying, Julia, 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 this is so-and-so. Hi, yeah, this is Larry. Uh, how can I help you? Is Ken there? <laughs> right. That was always the question. Is Ken there? And then, and then I would say he's here, and if he comes over, you have to feed him and and give him drinks. And they'd go, okay, okay, and that was it. <laughs> but everybody helped everybody else. I mean, we had a water maker uh, that we made plenty of water, uh, fresh water, um, every day. And so when we were in an anchorage, we would always get calls from people asking, could we spare some water? Because they didn't have a water maker. So we had boats coming up where they would send their kids over with a water jug, you know, in their dinghies and saying, can we have some water, please? And yeah, it's just what you did. Um, as far as working on land, I didn't have any skills that, that I could use. And uh, Ken, we did get Ken a job in Australia for about a month. Uh, but he really didn't like it. And so we didn't, um, he didn't stay at it. And uh, we were fortunate that we really didn't have to go pick apples or something. And we were free to be around, you know, to travel around the country that we were staying in. The problem with it is that seeing the world by sailboat is really a terrible way to do it. Because you end up in an anchorage or a, or a marina that is um, really out of, it's not right in the heart of town, you know, uh, and you're always concerned about the boat. So you never really feel good about leaving the boat. Finally, when we got to Turkey, um, we decided to leave the boat and we, there was a company at the marina that would watch your boat for you and they come aboard, they start our engines for us and they watch the, you know, watch out for the boat and everything. And then we were able to, to go traveling and we went to Europe for several months um, while we left the boat in Turkey. Uh, but for the most part, we stayed on board and, and fixed things. 
and rebuilt things. And it was constant. I mean, and, and it never ended. In Australia, I think, I mean, we, we replaced the autopilot. In uh, Israel, we put in, we installed the air conditioning. Um, in in uh, Turkey, we changed our uh, flexible uh, coupling for our transmission, or we installed one. Um, in, I mean, every destination, in New Zealand, we rebuilt the engine. These things take months and, and you know, and you don't know anybody, you don't know who to call, and so it takes a long time. So we didn't see, you know, we didn't get to do as much touring as, as we wanted. We hang out on the boat a lot. But in Turkey and Israel, you really were there for quite some time. As you said, you know, you went and traveled around Europe and um, looked like you really had kind of a full experience on land. Almost, well. We left the boat, we were in Turkey almost a year actually is where yeah. we left the boat there. That's why I asked, you know, if you, yeah. you work. We didn't work. Um, we, we traveled around Turkey some rented a car, drove around, uh, then flew to Europe, traveled around Europe for several months by train in the winter, lived with my friends in Switzerland for a month, um, then came back to the States to visit uh, folks uh, for a couple of months, and then went back to Turkey when it was time to sail on. Yeah, but um, so we, yeah, we were there a long time. We were in New Zealand for nine months, in Australia for, I think, nine months, in Israel for three months. So, and again, you're, you're waiting, you know, you're, you're either waiting out for weather or repairs. One of the two. Anyone else? Question. How did you do meals? Do what? Meals, eating. Meals. How did we do meals? Um, we, uh, when we crossed the Pacific, we had three months of food on board and that's without fish. So, uh, and then we caught a lot of fish and um, in every destination, we, you know, we'd go shopping. And, and um, I, uh, I remember when we were in the Canary Islands, getting ready to cross the Atlantic, uh, had myself and Ken, and then Patrick had come back, and we had one more crew. So there were four of us, and we had gone to the store shopping. And <clears throat> at the end of the shopping, I think we had eight or ten carts, you know, shopping carts filled with food. And as we went to the checkout, you know, and it was interesting because I said to the, to every, each of the crew members, are you sure that you only got what was on our list? Oh yeah, no, no, that's I, I, everything we do, you know, and I went around to each crew member, Patrick, are you sure you don't have extra stuff in there? Nope, uh, Larry, I don't, you know, okay, Francis, no, I'm, we didn't, I didn't buy anything, you know, whatever. And then I look at Ken and he goes, don't you even ask. <laughs> because <laughs> he get he got whatever he wanted but uh, yeah so uh we went and then we'd come bring it to the you know to the dock and the difficult part was when you're an anchor so you go shopping and you have all this food and then you have to take it out to the boat by dinghy and then you can't put the cardboard boxes on board because cardboard boxes have uh, bugs so you have to take each can out or each box or whatever it is uh, each package of noodles or whatever and put it from the dinghy up onto the boat and then you stow it and so you have this chain if it's, if it's just two of us it was a challenge and um we had a, every nook and cranny was filled and when we went to duty-free ports which were so, a lot of duty-free ports we would buy liquor duty-free so we would stock up so um i don't know if that picture is in the book or not but there's a picture of these bottles of booze lined up in uh, on the salon floor and we would buy about 20 or 30 big bottles of vodka and maybe 200 bottles of wine, you know, every time. Um, and, uh, yes, we drank too much. We never drank at sea, by the way, ever. Well, once when we crossed the equator, we had a little celebration party, but otherwise I didn't allow any alcohol at sea. Um, only when we got to anchor. Anybody anybody to anchor, one more could... question. Sorry, go ahead. One more question. Anybody else? EG had a question. EG, EG, you had a question. I just have a quick comment. I read Larry's book twice. I listened to his audio book and I watched him being interviewed about three dozen times. <laughs> he must really love you guys because today he disclosed some things, he spoke about some things I never heard him speak about. 
So he must feel really comfortable around you guys. So yeah, that, that was amazing. This was very new. Lots of things were very new for me. So okay. I stayed the whole thing because I, I, I was planning to leave early, but I was like, whoa, he just keeps on giving more and more. Like, wow. <laughs> I could go for days on the stories, you know. I mean, it's uh, so many things happened that, and sometimes I don't remember all of them. You know, and then sometimes I remember them and, and and then I'll ask Ken, is that the way it happened? And he goes, no, that's not the way it happened. And I said, well, yes, it is. You know, it's, it's, Anyone um, else? Wait, well, Dawn, had a, Dawn had a question. Dawn? Well, it was, it was a comment. Number one, I have friends who are stranded in New Zealand, uh, took exactly the same route, but because of COVID, they haven't been able to get back to Vancouver. And Lucky so them. have to continue getting visas renewed and but they love New Zealand. But something that struck me early on when you were talking was your comment that you had to have confidence because you had no other choice. And, and I thought about how, well, I'll just speak for myself, in my own life, there seems to be choice. And so we often don't step into the confidence, right? Um, and there was something very powerful in that, that, that sense of, you know, where is it that I can have confidence because I have no choice? And also constantly correcting. You were constantly correcting your course. So they were just two, two things that you said that had a real impact. Oh, thank and it's you. an amazing story. I got Terry hearing you talk about getting into the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> it's, it's, wow. I, I, yeah, it was, um, I, I think it's kind of an issue for me now, though, it's kind of presenting, a, you know, an issue is that I'm still talking about the trip. I'm still talking about my sailing journey around the world. And I've been back for, um, well, we returned in 2007. How many years is that? 13 years I've been back already. It's still the defining moment of my life was sailing back underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. And the, the whole journey, it's like, if I let go of the rest of my life and didn't even remember any of it, this would be enough. This was an entire lifetime in six years. And I still define almost everything I do from it. Everything I learned about, about life, I really learned on this journey, on this trip. It, it identify it uh, define your identity, didn't it? Yes, it is my it is it's become my new identity, and um, and then when I got home, I also uh, got my U.S. Coast Guard captain's license hmm. um, because I didn't I didn't have a captain's license when we, when I left, and so then um, you know so I've been hired to do professional captain jobs, which I really I don't love it that much, you know, because it's you're being paid to do something. I don't know. That seems we feel sorry for you, Larry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, two, uh, go ahead. Two things before we close. If you look in the chat box, Larry didn't mention it, but uh, several of us do know that he has these fabulous videos. And uh, if you just go in, it's LarryJacobson.com. And Larry, if I'm saying this wrong, correct me. Uh, but the videos are available. And so you can talk to him about that. And free. reach you, it's just Larry at LarryJacobson.com. Is that correct? That's my email, Larry at LarryJacobson.com. Okay. And the website, the website is, is I'll just put it here. It's um, Larry, is it HTTPS, EG? You don't need any of that. Just LarryJacobson.com. Thank you. Okay. And the other thing is you got to share at least about Skip and Connect. Oh. They've gotten right. short shrifted. Okay. So, um, uh, after I finished writing the, the book, um, and that was published in 2012, I think, uh, I went to a writer's workshop uh, in, the next year in 2013 with uh, my friend John, and it was up in Montana. It was really great. Well, the writer's workshop, I went just because John had asked me to go, and I thought, well, this could be interesting. And we get up there and they said, okay, you know, your first assignment for the first night was write something. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to write. I've already written a book. And it flashed on me that, um, I don't know, for some reason I had kids in my mind. And so I decided to write a children's book. And so I decided mm -hmm. to write the children's version of The Boy Behind the Gate. 
And what, you know, some, they said, well, what does that mean to you? And I said, I'm going to take out all the drugs and the sex. So, you know, and then, and then that would be the children's version of it. And um, so I did. And I started it that week in 2013. And I just published it last year. And the Pretty reason good. I think that it took me so long was, I mean, I had set it aside, you know, and I, I just, it's, it's kind of nonfiction in the sense that the stories are based on the real journey. But then I go off into like fiction land sometimes because it's for eight to 12 year olds. <laughs> and I remember asking my editor, uh, who is a rather famous uh, children's book editor, Kate Hogan, and uh, I, I, was, I had written myself into a corner about the Komodo dragons. And I said, geez, it would really help if the dragons could fly. And she says, why, why can't they? And I said, because Komodo dragons don't fly. And she goes, oh, Larry, think like a 10-year-old. This should not be hard for you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so the dragons fly. Anyway, yeah, so, it, so this book is called Let's Go. Oh, wait, I have to turn off my, uh, my background. And it addresses some bullying issues. Uh, it, it has, it's really good for kids who need a little self-esteem boost. Yeah, I, all the lessons, thanks, E.G., all the lessons that, you know, that I want to teach kids from this about sharing and caring for your friends and giving and doing good things, they're all in here. And so uh, it's called Let's Go. So. And the reason it's called Let's Go is because I thought it would translate really easily into Spanish and French. <laughs> but it's called um, The Adventures of Skip and Connect. The search begins for explorers and adventurers, boys and girls, ages 8 to 12. And it has uh, its paperback and it's a print on demand. Um, it's on Amazon. And it has some the, pictures. It's what? It has some pictures. It has beautiful illustrations, yeah. which are in the, that. in the print book are in black and white, but in the Kindle version are in four, full four color. So what you do is if you buy the paperback version, you get the Kindle version for free. And then you can look <laughs> at the pictures. Good Christmas anyway, present. Anyway, it's, it was, it's a fun read. I have actually a friend reading it now and he says that he goes, uh, he likes it better than the one behind the gate because it's easier. <laughs> Great holidays, since everybody's trapped in COVID. Great yeah. uh, gift. Oh, the other one is, I should put this. This is the original book, The Boy Behind the Gate. It's only available in hardbound, and it has a, it's a beautiful book with four-color photos and everything in it. So, Yeah, I like what Barbara said. It's a great way to travel when we can't. <laughs> Absolutely. Nice. Do you want to wrap it up? Larry, love you. Thank you so much. You were. I love all of you. It was wonderful. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you for taking, allowing us to take this brief journey across throughout the world with you. Um, we missed a lot of stops along the way, but thank you so much for sharing and caring. Well, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate it.